As believers, we are to be like Jesus. So what does that look like to us in our relationship with others? Brian's going to be talking about that right now. Hey guys, how you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you. I don't know if uh, any of you guys had a chance to enjoy the nice weather yesterday, but Common Ground Band was out at the festival. We had a good turnout, had some good music. It was a good time. Um, so thanks for any prayers for any of the outreach and things that took place that day. So just a, a reminder, when we do those types of events, it's not just for us to play music out somewhere. We, we, it is a ministry for us, so we make sure we, we're out there saying hi and just a, and it's not a Christian festival, so Christian music out there where everybody else is, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So question is, if we were more like Jesus, can you imagine what the world would look like? Can you think of a better role model? So in preparation for this weekend, I, I started focusing on Jesus' characteristics, his compassion, his patience, his servanthood, his love, forgiveness, commitment, his prayer life, kindness, his self-control, and I just thought, you know, what a great thing for us to focus on if we could be more like Jesus. And recently, you know, we've seen a lot of award shows go on. And <laughs> after watching just a few performances, I just started thinking, I mean, these are our role models for our children. Even more than that, I'm thinking these are role models for a lot of adults. And we ask the question, who are our role models and which ones can truly stand to the test, Right. Who is that standard? What is the measure of a great role model? Of these musicians and actors and politicians and teachers, YouTube stars, TikTok, Instagram, cartoon characters, comic book heroes, even parents as role models, elders of the church, are we measuring up to the standard of that ultimate role model? Who would that be? In the end of my thought process, I, I was just pointed to Jesus as the ultimate role model. So how did I come to that realization? Jesus is the ultimate role model. And I was reading a book recently by Max Lucado. Came across a passage where it spoke of the compassionate hands of Jesus. I just want to read you this passage. He said, may I ask you to look at your hand for a moment? Look at the back, then the palm. Reacquaint yourself with your fingers. Run a thumb over your knuckles. Notice how old you've gotten <laughs> What if someone were to film a documentary of, on your hands? Just put a GoPro right here and just follow your hand. What if a producer were to tell you your story based on the life of your hands? What would we see? As with all of us, the film would begin with an infant, infant's fist, then a close-up of a tiny little hand wrapped around mommy's finger. Then what? Holding onto a chair as you learn to walk, handling a spoon as you learn to eat. We aren't too long into the feature before we start seeing that hand being affectionate stroking daddy's face or petting a puppy. Nor is it too long before we see that same hand that's suited for more, like pushing your big brother, yanking back a toy, saying that's mine. All of us learned early that the hand is suited for more than survival. It's a, a tool of emotional expression. And that same hand can help or hurt, extend or clench, lift someone up or shove someone down. Were you to show the documentary to your friends, you'd, you'd be proud of certain moments, sure. Your hand extending with a gift, placing a ring on another's finger, doctoring a wound, preparing a meal, or folding in prayer. And then there are those other scenes that you're probably not so happy about. Shots of accusing fingers and abusive fists. Hands taking more often than giving and demanding instead of offering. Wounding rather than loving. Oh, the power of our hands. Leave them unmanaged and they become weapons. Clawing for power, strangling for survival seducing for pleasure, but manage them, and our hands become instruments of grace. Not just tools in the hands of God, but God's very hands. Surrender them, and these five-fingered appendages become hands of heaven. That's what Jesus did. Our Savior completely surrendered his hands to God. The documentary of his hands has no scenes of greedy grabbing or unfounded finger pointing. It does, however, have one scene after another of people longing for his compassionate touch. Parents carrying their children, the poor bringing their fears, 
the sinful shouldering their sorrow. In each who came was touched. Each one was changed. But none was touched or changed more than the unnamed leper in Matthew 8. When Jesus came down from the hill, great crowds followed him. Then a man with a skin disease came to Jesus, and that man bowed before him and said, Lord, you can heal me if you will. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I will be healed. And immediately the man was healed from his disease. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded for people who are made well. This will show the people what I've done. So just a few weeks, if you, a few weeks back, if you remember, I was speaking on Christ-like humility, Jesus-like humility. And my frame of mind going into that research was that I believe that ultimately our goal is to be more like Jesus, right? And if we're saying that we're Christ followers, then it's a good idea that we seek out his personality, his characteristics, his attributes, and then we apply them into our lives. I mean, that's just a basic principle for us. So just as a recap from a couple weeks back, if you weren't here, we asked the question, how do I humble myself? What does that look like? We learned that we can prepare our hearts and we can declare him right in all things. We acknowledge God in all things. Understand his attributes, that he is good and just God. That we are to learn from others' humbling experiences. Put aside our pride and actually learn from someone who's gone through it before. That we are to think less of ourselves and lose that entitlement. Put others first. Remember we live in a self-indulgent world where the, this entitlement or this idea of self reigns supreme. In all situations, we can choose the lowest place. And most of all, we are to secure ourselves to Christ. What a great example than none, none other than Jesus, that he, that God himself, fully divine, fully human in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, humbled himself and came to be our savior. So if Jesus humbled himself and he is the ultimate role model, then we should seek that out too. And today we're going to continue that study and discuss Jesus's character to know him better and apply what we learn in our lives. Today we're going to talk about his compassion, what it actually means to have Christ-like, Jesus-like compassion. So during my studies, I read a passage that said, and it kind of shocked me a little, you know, it was speaking about Christians and how we are perceived in the, our world today. And this, this kind of hit me a little hard. It said that we used to be the home team, right? You know, there's a football game today. I know Jeff's excited. The you know, Dolphins are playing the Bills, and Jerry's going to be watching, I'm sure. But, but when you're at the home team, you have home team advantage, right? And it said that we used to be the home team, and now we're the away team. Speaking of Christians and our walk in faith in the world that we live in, so the challenge that is facing Christians in America right now is to remain deeply engaged in public matters, even as we hold more lightly to the things of the world. To react to the loss of influence, not with a clenched fist, but with a calm confidence, with love. And for us to ultimately show how a life of faith can transform lives in ways that are characterized by joy and grace. Most challenging of all is what do we do with a world filled with poverty and suffering and oppression? When we're confronted with these kinds of questions, it provokes certain things in us. How do we respond when confronted with suffering of others? Well, it might look like guilt, right? And we have responses when we see people in need or situations where our hearts are pulled. We might report that, well, you know, I, I support some children with world vision. So um, if you're looking for me for help, I've already, I'm already helping, you know, so you get this guilt feeling. You've got to defend yourself. Or that we went on a walk for hunger to raise money to help the homeless, or that we give a certain amount of money to saving, you know, several life-saving ministries, we start to justify ourselves, I think. Or maybe we deflect. Maybe this, you know, vision of suffering that we see around us, that we deflect and we refer to the peers that are around us that might be richer and say, you know, they have bigger house, better car, you know, maybe they're the ones that are being stingy and should start forking out some money or taking care of the poor or, you know, showing up and helping people and volunteering. I mean, after all, I'm not a famous athlete or a famous musician. I don't have that kind of resource, you know. Let them do it. Or maybe it provokes in us a feeling of denial. So we use statistics about middle class in India and, and, and say we, there's examples of how stories of the poor in India are exaggerated so just to get our, get our money. So we start having this denial that it's not there, that that suffering doesn't exist. I mean, after all, you know, we, we, we dive into some books that like, when helping hurts, or 
talks of charity. These are actual books that decide that the best thing we could do in response to poverty is nothing. After all, we don't want to hurt the poor by demeaning them or throwing money at them. Or maybe we just have straight up ignorance. So we'll say that we really don't know how to help because, well, the really desperate people are far away from us. They're in another country or they're far, far away or whatever it might be. And they're victimized by systems that I can't affect, I can't impact. So is that how we're to respond? I don't think so. Is that the compassion that Christ displayed? No. What would he do in this situation? And that's why I think it's important for us to cling to Jesus in this area of our lives, to have compassion like Jesus. There's a quote that said, compassion can't be measured in dollars and cents. It comes with a price tag, but the price tag isn't the amount of money spent. The price tag is love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to just learn more about your nature, learn more about your characteristics that we might begin to be the hands of Jesus right here, right now, in our community, in our house, wherever we are, to have that level of compassion that we are meant to have, to have that heart change, to respond to all that you've done for us, Lord. You know, the great commission that Jesus, that you gave us to send us out into the world today, and, and you also gave us this compassion that we are able to have just as Jesus demonstrated, that shapes the way we see and treat people that we meet. In your name we pray. Amen. So compassion. Obviously, anytime I dive into one of these, I do a word study and, and jump into it and try to get a great definition, but I don't just take the Webster definition. I like to look into it a little more. I think this has a lot more impact on what we want to know about and how to change our lives. So I didn't want to just take a standard, you know, it's recognizing people's suffering and, you know, whatever it is. So I dived into a little more, did a word study, and, you know, it comes from the Latin word compati, which literally means to suffer with. When I read that, it kind of changed the way I thought about it, to suffer with. Immediately started to think of Jesus, to suffer with. I think of him at the tomb of Lazarus. He didn't go there just to prove a point and that he could be all glorious and powerful. He went there because he had friends that were in pain. He came alongside them also to suffer with them, and he wept. He suffered with them. He took that pain. He comes alongside us and suffers with us in our pain and our grief and agony. And to put it simply, it's an active response to your pain in my heart. That's compassion. That's Jesus' compassion. It's a response, an action of your pain in my heart. I have a couple stories for you. I'll find some illustrations about compassion. First one's called the obnoxious professor. A college professor met his new class on the first day of school. He stood before the students and gave a nice introduction to the class and, and, and about himself, you know, had this whole monologue prepared about who he was. And he looked around the room and asked his students, if any of you think you are stupid, stand up. And he looked around and saw none of his students standing up. The college professor looked around again and asked the question again. He said, if anyone thinks he or she is stupid, stand up. So he looked around, and to his surprise, one student way in the back stood up. And he goes, what? kind of surprised, so you think you're stupid? And he goes, no, I just didn't want you to feel alone. <laughs> that's compassion. Here's one that's a little more serious. This one's the man on the subway. There's this gentleman who decides to get on the subway in New York. He's, I picture that he's going home from work, you know, and people are sitting quietly, and some are reading newspapers, and and some lost in thoughts, and others resting with their eyes closed. I mean, you can picture this serene, calm, peaceful scene, right? Everybody's just tick, 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 traveling home. And suddenly a man at the next stop gets on with his kids. They enter the subway car like a hurricane. The, ch the children are so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed, and the man sat down next to me, he, or sat down next to the guy and closed his eyes, and apparently oblivious to the situation... The children were yelling back and forth and throwing things and grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, right? You can imagine. And yet the man sitting next to me didn't do anything. It was difficult not to feel irritated, and he could not believe that this guy the sitting next to him could be so insensitive that he let his children run wild like that and did nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. I mean, the nerve of the guy, right? And it was easy to see that everyone else on the subway felt irritated too. So finally, with what... He felt that was unusual patience. I mean, he had to go above and beyond to be patient with this guy. He finally, against all his better judgment, said, I'm going to say something. 
Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people, and I wonder if you couldn't control them just a little bit more. A little sarcasm, probably. A little, you know, condescending remark. This gentleman lifted his gaze as if to just come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time, kind of realizing his kids are running amok. He said, yeah, you're right. I guess I, I should do something. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago, and I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either, so I, I know they're acting out. I apologize. Can you imagine what that guy felt like at that moment, the paradigm shift that he went through? Suddenly he saw things differently because he saw differently, he thought differently, he felt differently. He behaved differently. His irritation just vanished. He didn't have to worry about his controlling his attitude or his behavior. His heart was filled with this man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died. I'm I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. Can you tell me about it? Is there anything we can do to help? In this story, the man on the subway didn't, he didn't have full context about this guy getting on there with kids going crazy. He probably just thought, you know, just like we do when we go into Walmart, we see kids going crazy and doing things. We automatically just wow, can't they control their kids? This is unbelievable. But he didn't have the context, and he didn't look at this gentleman as if he was a son of God, a child of the Almighty. Didn't give him any any chance of, you know, maybe there is something different that I don't know. Maybe I should extend some grace. What if we didn't wait for this type of moment to happen to us before we start seeing people as Jesus did? To see his people as he sees them, we can do this. We should remember who we're looking at a being made in the divine image of God who is deeply loved. See them for who they really are, precious and beloved. How does it feel to look with this intention? How does it feel to be seen with such tenderness? So we're going to learn more about how Jesus interacted with those in need. So compassion, again, has been defined as your pain in my heart. What pain our Lord must have felt when he ministered from place to place in his travels and in his ministry. We're going to be looking in Luke 7, um, 11 through 17. I'll put some scripture on, on the, the screens here. But Luke gives us an insight into the compassion of Jesus in four different but very similar stories because they dealt with Jesus' compassion. Where Jesus is confronted with miseries of a dying servant, with a grieving widow, a perplexed prophet, and a repentant sinner. And he helped every one of them. He helped them all because compassion does not measure, it ministers. Let me say that again. Compassion does not measure, it ministers. And I'm going to focus on the story of the widow and Jesus' response to her despair. So we're in Luke 7, 11 through 17 for the whole story. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, and he was the only son of, him, of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier, which is a bed that a body is placed on for burial. He, he touched the bier and, and they, that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said, and God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. What a story. We're going to look and kind of unpack that a little bit, right? So it says that he traveled to Nain. Nain is about 25 miles from Capernaum. That's where he was. And so he went 25 miles by foot. That's a good day's journey from where he was. And he wasn't even asked to go there. He, he knew he needed to be there, right? So since the Jews buried their dead the same day, it's likely that Jesus and his disciples had arrived at the city gate late in the afternoon that the boy died, right? So imagine this scene at the city gate. You have Jesus coming into the city, and you know behind him at this time, people just flocked and followed, and it was disciples and a crowd. So you just see this crowd coming into the city, But you also see this other crowd, completely different in demeanor. A widow with people following her, carrying her dead son. What a total contrast of two conflicting sides of the story, right? 
you can imagine the crowds that following Jesus, they were full of rejoicing because they just seen a number of miracles and blessings that the, the Lord was done. And they're hoping, and he, what is he going to do next? You know, and they, this is amazing. We're following this amazing Messiah. And this other crowd, just devastated. Jesus was heading for the city full of hope and full of joy, and the murderers were heading for the cemetery. Jesus could easily identify with the widow's heartache. Not only was she in sorrow, but she was now left alone in a society that did not have resources to care for widows. So what would happen to her? Jesus felt the pain that sin and death have brought into this world, and he did something about it. So let's look closer what Jesus' actions were. First, he recognized. He recognized the pain, the situation, the sorrow, the need. It says, when the Lord saw her, he recognized her pain and he was aware of her situation. He saw the sorrow and grief. His heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. He felt, he acknowledged, he suffered with her in that moment. And with understanding, saying words of encouragement, of faith and of healing. But here's where it differs from sympathy, right? Sympathy, you can just, man, that's a really tough situation. I feel for that. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to, yeah. Here's where it does a little bit different. He acted. Jesus acted. He went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, get up. He healed the dead man, rose him back to life. You see, here Jesus faced the enemy. He faced death. When you consider the pain and grief that death causes in the world, it's truly an enemy, and only Jesus can give us victory. Jesus had only to speak the word, and the boy was raised to life and in full health. The boy gave two evidences of life. He sat up, and he spoke. He wasn't in a coffin, so it was easier for him to sit up. And I can, I can only imagine what he said. That had to be interesting. Like, you know, nice yawn, and what's everybody doing? What's going on here? When an act, what an act of tenderness, I wrote, for Jesus to then take the boy and then give him to his mother. Can you imagine that? Pick up, scoop up this child and take him to the mother who was obviously probably crying uncontrollably and just now just doesn't know how to respond. Just mouth dropped, my, my boy's back. When we're reunited with our rightful place with the Lord, I imagine it's going to be something like that this awesome feeling of what the compassion that they have for us. Thank you, Jesus. The response of the people was to glorify God and identify Jesus as the prophet the Jews had been waiting for. And it didn't take long for this news of this miracle, this act of compassion to spread to all different parts of the land and even now to us. People grew more enthusiastic to see Jesus and the crowd, I would imagine, became one as they followed him. So what does that mean to us? What does that mean to me? How do we apply it in our lives? What have we learned today? That, that true compassion, Jesus' compassion, is found through recognition, through feeling and acknowledging, and it will ultimately, through action. That's compassion. So first, we need to just remember that the world's full of suffering people. We need to try to stay soft. When we're exposed to miseries and devastations, we don't want to just get used to that situation and get desensitized to the pain. It should bother us when people suffer. It should pull at our heartstrings. So don't get used to it. And I'm not saying for us to go crazy about the human suffering and think that it's all on our shoulders, that we have to control it all and we go a little bit crazy with it. No, I'm saying don't, let it, don't hesitate to let it bother you. Get bothered and ask yourself, why does it bother me so much? What can I do to help? How can I be a part of God's story? Be intentional about that. Recognize what's going on around you. Respond to the human need. And remember, people aren't exactly what we think they are when we size them up, just by their image or stereotype. That person to whom you're talking to might be somebody's brother or son, sister or daughter. We need to live with the eyes of Jesus and see people differently. And then feel and acknowledge we... With understanding, we need to open our hearts and come alongside those in need and share in their suffering. We need to target these actions and be intentional again. None, none of us by ourselves can care for the entire world and all of its needs, but we can choose to be a part of what God's doing. Immediately in our area, in our homes, next door. It might just start in this city. It could be in your neighborhood or even in your own house, but we need to focus. 
we need to be intentional and be diligent. We should be present and res- recognize those hurting around us and read the situations and enter into that suffering with them. Don't just give money to the shelter, but go and eat with the homeless person at the shelter. Find out his name. Don't just send a card to the family member in the nursing home. Show up and listen to their stories. Cry with them. And let's turn off our phones for a while and be present. Oh, that's a whole other sermon. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sermon notes. But there's something there too. In your own homes, be present. Because there's something going on around you that you might not be aware of. And if we recognize it and acknowledge it, we can come alongside people and be present in their lives. Then, Work on transforming your view of other people and looking into their eyes and fully seeing someone for who they really are, a child of God, a person created in the image of God. And keep in mind that image could be tainted because of decisions they made. That's okay. They they have sin in their heart, you know, just like we do. We have sin in our lives. But first acknowledge them for being God's child. That's enough for us to act on, right? So we recognize, we feel, we, we acknowledge, but then most importantly, to take this further than sympathy, we are going to take some action. We might not be able to do everything, but we can do something. We're not going to solve all the problems of the world, but you can help one person. You can help a family. You can help the community. And God isn't commanding us to solve the problems of the world. That's what God does. That's what he's here for. But he's inviting us to be engaged in the work that he's doing. So we need to to do something. We need to live out love. We think first John, we think of first John 3, 16 through 18, where it says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be present in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So if we can help someone, and we have the resources, we have time, we have access to help, and we don't help them, then where's the reality of our life? Where's the reality of our love? And finally, give out of your own pain. When I read this in in the study, I was like, wow, what does that mean, to give out of your own pain? Meaning that all of us have something unresolved inside of us. It could be relational, emotional, physical, or from even a financial sense. Let God work in the midst of your own pain. Maybe if we feel lonely, maybe that's God's way to trigger in us our attention to the homeless person. Or if we feel abandonment issues, then maybe that's God's way to trigger us to get involved in prison ministry. If we live with regret over years spent before knowing Jesus, maybe God can use us to reach out to people who have not yet heard about him. Paul summarizes this idea for the Corinthians. He says, comfort us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We go through things and we can come alongside other people. It's one of the things that I learned from doing ministry with my brother. My brother had, you know, some addiction problems, but he also loved God. and He was able to communicate with people with addiction problems better than I ever could because I didn't have that issue. But he, he understood And so people see that. They see the truth in you. So use your pain to come alongside other people and be a part of God's story. All of us have this capacity for compassion as we were made in God's image. So his strength and love and mercy, grace and truth, they're always with us. So now it's time to act, right? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. We thank you for giving us a heart that It has the capacity for this compassion, this compassion that might just seem daunting to us because, man, we see so many things and so many instances of suffering that how can can we help? How can I help? Just me. God, I'm praying for your wisdom, your strength to guide us in these moments that we might recognize the situation. We can see the sorrow and the grief that's going on around us and we open up our hearts to feel and acknowledge those people as just your children and that that's enough for us to act on. And let it not be just sympathy. Let it be something that we then are intentional about and we moved and we shake things and we get up out of our seats and we start acting upon it. 
Let us be the change that you need us to be in the areas of our lives, in our communities, in our homes, so that we can come along those and we can take their pain into our heart and change lives. It's your name we pray. Amen. Because he